our esteemed professor Farida Siddiqui ji, who is absolutely one of the brightest professors in economics and also the chairperson of faculty induction program. Uh, Dr. Abdul Tahaji, who is also assisting Professor Faridaji in conducting this program and is also a bright scholar, in fact. Dear participants, friends, invited guests, if any, and dear faculty members, let me at the very outset tell all people that I'm happy to see you in good mood and karyat se aapko dekh ke bohut hi khush mein ho raha hu because Manu has been very, very close to my heart always right from the day it was founded because of my love for Urdu and because of my love for Persian, because of my love for Islamic culture, you know, and many, many things in fact. This program uh, also, in fact, I have the problem at the end. In fact, I may forget. So I profusely thank Professor Farida ji, you know, I profusely thank her for inviting me to share my ideas on this topic with all of you. There is mine of information that I have acquired by dint of my experience in working in various universities, personally facing a hell lot of challenges, problems and so on. I'll place all of them in an academic context before all of you hope you will benefit from this lecture. And I deserve your attention, you know. The topic has been very rightly chosen, research and professional development and academic leadership challenges also. You know, uh, the purpose of this lecture would also be to bring to your notice the problems and the challenges that we all researchers, we all teachers, in academic field face nowadays, because our research pertains to social sciences. Or maybe some of us also deal with, you know, sciences by devoting ourselves to the subjects like history of science technology, history of biodiversity, history of, you know, environment, and various other disciplines. For professional development, we need to be professional in doing research. Professional in the sense that any idea that we reflect intelligently on the nature of human society or subject pertaining to our research has to be culled inductively from fullness of experienced life. You know, that's basically the human experience one of the first knowledge, I would say, is our own experience, in fact, in the entire working of academics. We have also to keep in mind the rational deduction from inherent eternal truth. There are certain things which we refer as eternal truth, because what we call research today in social sciences or many other allied fields has transcended from this age old wisdom and restructured contours, in fact, of knowledge and changed and reshaped human vision, always fresh from time to time. The human vision, which has evolved out of experience, out of knowledge, out of the age old wisdom. You know, we always keep on quoting such examples. And the major learning process which has begun in human species is a cumulative nature. This entire process of knowledge, wisdom, experience, restructuring of vision, all these things are basically, you know, a cumulative experience which survives even death. I am a professor with experience today, I may die, but this experience will be carried forward in terms of knowledge. So knowledge does not die, even after death also, death of an individual and can be transmitted to next generation as it has been happening. It is this cumulative increase of knowledge which constitutes the essence of developmental process. You know, even if we have to grow professionally, we have to grow in the field of knowledge. It is this cumulative process of knowledge, you know, 
that contributes development process in research and also uh, our professional development in all these things. People's consciousness of themselves, which produces agricultural tools in very ancient times, for example. Even the human civilizations which were produced from ancient times, in fact. Today, social science are enterprise of modern world. We are not talking about ancient. The discipline is rooted in developed system, secular knowledge about any reality that is validated empirically, particularly post 16th century. You know, we, we, we do talk in terms of uh, secularism today. It has, it has really come under attack also, in fact. We find that basically the secularism is not simply, it has not developed yesterday. It has developed over a long period of time from the beginning of 16th century. And in secularizing this knowledge, we have had great contribution from Persians, from Persian Empire, Iranians, and many other elements, in fact, of Persian civilization. And in India, the first person I would quote and say is Obul Faz. I'll give you one simple example because I'm a medieval historian and I have always biased for medieval for choosing these examples. Let me, for example, if we look at Islamic history, when we look at Islamic history, we keep on always saying, you know, we keep on saying that there was a period of Jahiliya. If you look at most of the Persian works, most of the texts, in fact, even Arabic also, you find that the concept of Jahiliya was there. And when knowledge began to spread, and when Arab civilization began to spread to various other parts of the world, they began to periodize everywhere the ancient period as Jahiliya. But it was Abul Fazl in Indian context, you know, who questioned this. And in Iran, it was Azhar Kayyan in Persia. You know, they questioned this theory and added new knowledge so that the whole thing could be secularized. You know, so secularism is not simply because Congress party has done it or somebody else has done it. There are hundreds and hundreds of years that has taken this idea to mature, to develop, you know, and to reach to such a stage. And in research, there exists a symmetry between past and future. It, it never ends. It's always there. And at one time, there was no need to distinguish between past, future, or present, because we believed everything coexisting in eternal, you know, context, for example. At some point of time, we thought that everything is eternally existing, and therefore, uh, we, we need not, you know, uh, sort of, make any distinction between past and present or future. But there's a fundamental distinction between nature and humans, between matter and mind, and also, you know, between physical world and the social spiritual worlds. There are different connections in this, but there's always what we call self-consciousness because without self-consciousness the dynamics of any evolutionary system is one of random mutation and selection the evolutionary process became at least teleologically the sense that it is directed by the image of future you know in minds of active researchers who were capable of affecting the system it's always you know teleological in nature. We must remember in research and professional development, there is no shortcut. And there is not a single formula. Here, the assumption tends to be made that if we are ignorant, we cannot significantly contribute to professional development. I mean, ignorant in the sense, if we do not have knowledge, we know very little, but have to know more about it constantly and keep making ourselves knowledgeable at each point of time with new ideas and new trends. I would, I would really like to tell you an interesting thing. What is important here is that what moves the great masses of people to action until we did not know about it can be successful in research, for example. I mean, how those great ideas have developed in academics, in civilizational values, in science technology, in various other things, in judiciary, in all aspects, in fact, if you look at. 
I would like to give an example. There's a beautiful book. The book is in two volumes. In fact, it's not written there, volume one and volume two, but there are two parts of the book. It was written by Franco Pan. It is, I am quoting this book because it belongs to this decade and it has very important relevance for us, how social science people can contribute very significantly that also leads to their professional development. Franco Pan wrote Silic Root, first volume, and then a second volume before four or five years came. If you look at second volume, he has illustrated how Qatar, which was a small emirate or a khanate, you know, a small country with limited resources and oil, but had no significant technology and so on, and did not have a world presence at all. And how Qatar produced out of the money they produced on airlines, which carries largest number of passengers in this century, you can imagine from one continent to another continent, and touched almost every part of the world and brought home plenty of employment and plenty of money also. The second important thing that Franco Pan states, which many of us are aware now, you know, Franco Pan nearly half a decade ago, when he did research, he said that Bangalore would become so congested and Bangalore at one point of time will not have a drop of water because he studied how nature had been destroyed in fact. And then the history of Karnataka, he studied all these things and then gave us this idea. Today we find when scientists started working, they also found that it was absolutely good. It was absolutely knowledgeable on his part. Who could have known for an instance, in fact, that an obscure place a carpenter in tiny, you know, small town of Roman Empire would have established a movement for building enormous cathedrals all over Europe, America, and various other places. Or, for example, the most importantly, I can tell you, a camel driver in Arabia would have carried characteristics of Arab civilization to the whole world. You know, right from one end of the, to all, cutting across various continents, in fact. As researchers, we must remember, how social science was historically constructed as a form of knowledge and why it was divided into various standard disciplines from late 18th to 20th century. That's one of the significant points that I would like to bring, you know, to your attention. The other questions, the other rather important ones are to elucidate a series of basic intellectual queries. In India, there is unclarity today. I am really pain to tell you that in India, there's unclarity today in social sciences, particularly in the country such as, you know, ours, the question of nationalism, the question of secularism, the evolution of science, and everything we contributed to Holoman, to all kinds of, you know, ideas, and every bit of the growth of knowledge being attributed to religious scriptures and so on. I am not against any religion for that matter. But to say that, you know, we alone produced the world sinus, to say that we did everything and the world copied us because our ancient civilization was so rich, we as historians cannot digest it, for example. We always take pride and we are proud that mathematics developed in India. But all these sciences, be it Ayurveda, be it mathematics, be it anything, it did not develop in isolation. From second century BC, we had contacts with the Arab civilization. I mean, if you go to Arabs, for example, or in your mathematics in India also, we say in Urdu, Hindsa. What is that Hindsa? It's an Arab term. So knowledge does not develop in isolation. Knowledge developed by interacting with various civilizations. Therefore, what is so great about ancient India is basically, it may be great if some people accept it, but at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that the civilizations of Egypt, Mesopotamia, Arab world, Persian world, Central Asia, and many other contribute, uh, countries have also significantly contributed to this idea. They have significantly contributed to science technology in our country. From second century BC, we find Indians going to Persia for the sake of learning things about iron technology. And today I say, no, 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 Aryans were indigenous. Everybody was born in India only. The, we only, you know, belong to God and nobody else. 
such ideas this is what i say that there is lot of unfortunate unclarity about social sciences today when we organize different disciplines they serve function of disciplining the minds and channeling the scholarly energy that's also you know the 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 contribution of knowledge in various disciplines because they serve for function you know and at the same time they discipline the human minds and channelize the scholarship in fact but there has to be some level of consensus about the validity of dividing lives if they are to work the classification of social sciences constructed around two antinomies the antinomy between past and present and the antinomy between idiographic and nomothetic disciplines for example the another antinomy is between the civilized and the barbaric world that's also barbarism is not simply you know we say tribes ancient early medieval tribes and so on that is barbarism in modernity and modernism also greatest barbarism exists today when we don't care for the nature when we don't don't care for the cleanliness of the cities urban rural areas when we don't care and have discipline we are barbarians if we do not listen to the rule of law for example so therefore i am not only talking of the past the principal administrative mode of dealing with the protests for example about the present divisions has led to the multiplication of interdisciplinary programs of research a process that continues unabated for example you know my point here is that as intellectuals you do not come on the road side and say zindabad or murdabad as intellectuals you question certain opinions you indulge in critical thinking and you also register protest in terms of knowledge system in terms of knowledge base and that's how you keep on you know doing your protest and the social scientists have to expand the number and variety of pedagogical research structures for professional development you know various pedagogical research structures have to be developed we'll come to it and define it rather much more uh, clearly in fact in a moment so as researchers therefore we need to take a hard look at their present structures and try to bring the revised intellectual perceptions of useful framework i mean if we say that there is something that cannot be changed then we believe in unchangeable because knowledge ideas perceptions perspectives thinking it cannot be static it changes from time to time that we need to acknowledge and therefore intellectual perceptions also change with that and if we have to make a new useful framework then we need to drastically change the kind of system that's available to us and see how best we can model there is a serious overlap and resource shortage in increasing simultaneously and this may add up to the major blockage in future of furtherance of knowledge in future in our country that's my impression i mean i may be wrong i wish i could be proved wrong but let me tell you that there is if you look at what is happening in social sciences today you may be doing better in hyderabad central university you may be doing better in molana azad urdu national university you may be doing better in somewhere else but what's happening in jnu you know why a university gets destroyed overnight what's happening in delhi university what was happening in allahabad university what's happening all across the country in various institutions there is a serious on one side a financial crunch but on the other side you find that there is a decline in intellectual thinking because the critical minds are not being patronized and critical minds have been suffocated they are not permitted to reveal the truth what they are feeling they are not permitted to you know indulge in intellectual debates that would take this country forward you know but if we want to resist these handicaps or protest as intellectuals there are problems there are plenty full of problems i am not critiquing the government or anybody else but i am placing as an intellectual my agony before you because the problems are let us remember another reality of present time to answer our problem while we have been describing a general pattern in social sciences today the detailed classifications vary from country to country region to region state to state institution to institution for example look at our country here 
the kind of pattern that you may have in Manu may not be available. The same pattern may not be there in Usmania University. It may not be there in Andhra University. This pattern may not be in Delhi University. You can imagine there are institutional specificities. I acknowledge that there's specificities have to be there, but at least there has to be some commonality also because we are academicians. We are running academic programs. We are running professional programs. I mean, I train a student for doing his PhD into maybe a, a, you know, biodiversity, science technology, or maybe ethnography and so on, but he doesn't fit, he doesn't get a job at all because the other university does have a different program. They have a different kind of labeling, you know? So these are some of the difficulties which actually are intellectual. I would not say government because government is neither capable of nor they will entertain such kind of things, but it's the intellectuals who have to take care of these things for taking these institutions forward. The degree of internal cohesiveness, for example, and flexibility of disciplines. It varies today both between disciplines and in the form the discipline assumes around the world. You see, it varies between the disciplines you find. And at the same time, it also changes its form of the entire discipline throughout the world. The pressure for change, therefore, is not uniform. You look at what is happening in social sciences in USA, what's happening in social sciences in India, what's happening in social sciences in, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Persia, and America, for example, are among the European countries. Besides, at present, different communities of social scientists find themselves in different political camps. That is one of the worst part, in fact, that intellectuals are finding themselves in different political camps, situations, and regionally, and even institutionally. You see, different situations they find, and therefore they are not in a position to compete professionally. They are not able to devote much of the time to their intellectual activity. And even if they do it, they are trying to first put into their mind the kind of ideology that they are supporting or that they are opposing. So therefore, when we say the intellectual has to be as much objective as possible, that's not possible because the level of intellectual has declined in this country for last half a decade. In the West, the discipline progresses and with that professional development also embraces entire intellectual community. You look at professorship in America, you look at professorship in Europe, in fact, you find that the discipline makes a great progress. You, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate in a moment, you will see how these ideas of different disciplines have come about, in fact, and how India kept on borrowing these ideas from the outside. You know, in USA, university structures are multiple, for example. They are diverse also. And at the same time, they are decentralized. While as in Indian context, it's not like that. In US, you find the US has a long history of structural experimentation. The invention of graduate schools in 19th century, which were introduced in our country here, in fact, in late 80s now. Modification of German seminar system, for example, and the invention of electives, it has come late 90s into Indian context. But it was available in US and Germany in 19th century. The invention of social science research councils, for example, which was also grounded in India in late 80s, in fact. After the First World War, it was prevalent in West. The introduction of core course requirement. I mean, we are debating that for the last one decade or so, or maybe three decades or two decades but it was not there because this we also borrowed from outside. The invention of area studies, for example. And mind you, when we talk of women's studies, you know, ethnic programs, biodiversity programs, diasporic studies, you know, if you look at is all landed into India in late 70s. If you take almost all universities in the country, I don't think a women's program, women's studies program is there in every university. It's not there in every university, even now I did. Or if you look at you know, ethnography, for example, it's not in every university. While as these have evolved over a period of time, much, much before, in fact, in the post-World War, you know, in other European countries and other countries also. So such kind of imaginative solutions are necessary for professional development here. You know, we need to 
be very imaginative if we want professionally to develop and need to think about what we are doing and what we need to do, in fact. In India today, many academic programs and systems are disbanded suddenly. Many academic programs. I mean, even, even science technology, you go in social sciences, you see there are many programs which are completely disbanded. We have to explore the room for experimentation if we want professional development in this. For example, in Humboldt University, Berlin, the university department has become first in Europe to create a department of European ethnology. Why we, we not have Deccani ethnology? Why we cannot have Tamilian ethnology? Why we cannot have Kashmiri ethnology? Or for that matter, why we cannot have an Indian ethnology? We don't have such departments. We have a lack on these issues. In many Western university physical anthropologies has been incorporated into biology. Now we don't have anthropology in all universities. You, can, you see, this imbalances the research and development because we may produce wonderful work, but it doesn't fit into anywhere because we don't have real interoperability research to give us feedback, to give us backup, in fact. A student who does history, who does economics, I mean, if he looks into the other problems also, ethnographical problems, anthropological problems, it can enrich our study and it can provide answers and solutions to many problems of social scientists in this country and also the society's problems can be answered because we always say universities are created to provide solutions to the problems of society. So in many Western universities, physical anthropology has been incorporated you know, into biology, I was telling you, and exchange programs, academic linkages, encouragement to new projects, which is missing in Indian context on a larger scale. We may have some programs, we say joint research, we say adjunct professorship within the university and so on, which are basically, I would say, simply was just filling up, you know, certain formalities in academics. But so far as research is concerned, it's hampered. Multiplicity of languages for scholarship, or, you know, or for scholarly use in various universities. Linguistic richness, for example. I mean, if I say, that for linguistic richness, the Persian has to be promoted in this country, for example. Now, Urdu, which has become an international language, Urdu is not simply a language of some people in India, for example. Urdu has become an international language. I mean, if you go to Dubai, if you go to Central Asia, you meet people different. You, you have, you know, larger Indian diaspora, Urdu in diaspora all over the world who speak Urdu, in fact. So if such languages have to be promoted, for example, we say, Hindi has to be patronized so that a Tamilian can understand mainland politics, mainland economics, mainland society very clearly. He says, no, I don't want to study Hindi at all. Keep it in the mainland, I don't want. And if we similarly want mainland to learn about the Tamil history, to learn about the, you know, the Kini languages, they will also say goodbye to it. We don't want it. You know, and that is not the approach intellectuals should have to adopt. It is duty of the intellectuals that they address these issues, that this is for the development of intellectual and this is for the development of knowledge in our country. You look at, for example, our research methods have become fixed rather than open to accommodate new knowledge, cutting the cross divide between social and natural science. They have become totally stagnant and fixed nowadays because there is no patronization, there is no grants, there is no faculty. We don't have, you can imagine, more than few thousand posters open in all universities, completely vacant, but people are not filling it up. It's not simply people are not, filling. there's something behind the scene, you know, happening in government also, which, which, which is not interested in this. Latin American, America, for example, look, have a look at operators in institutions not beholden to traditional knowledge, for example. In Africa and Latin America, there are different independent institutions, though only few have created alternative avenues for research. What I mean to say is, not that we are totally redundant, but I say that if we say we are representing the old civilization, if we say that we are the largest democracy in the world, we do not have compatible amount of ideas. We are not producing intellectuals as per our volume of this country, as per the problems of, you know, the volume of problems in this country and so on. So you look at Sussex University as a curriculum which is divided equally between social and natural sciences. 
and look at our, we don't have interaction with scientists within the same university. I'm sure if many of my colleagues would see that you, you don't have even talking atmosphere, you know, between one school and other, because everybody wants to say, I am a great intellectual. Why should I go to Urdu learning and so? Why should I go to science department and so on? Like, you know, we find that in such circumstances, we have to exercise a caution. Because let us exercise a caution, which may have otherwise serious consequences because the situation in India is becoming dismal. I'm not disheartening you. I'm not discouraging you. But as a historian, I feel when I look at system, I need to place my, you know, ideas before you. Before I illustrate what qualities are expected of a leader in the field of education, what practical difficulties they face, what strategies should be adopted from time to time, which are within the purview of this lecture and my understanding, we start by examining some of the basic questions in Indian context. Because it's not simply that university, we, we, we debate about the university education, because for university education, our basic thing is that our products come from overall education system. When we look at catchment areas, it comes from different colleges. When we look at colleges, because our faculty comes from colleges, it comes from secondary education. And when we do secondary education, it comes from the primary education. Therefore, if the entire structure has to develop, if it has to bring in efficiency and dynamism into it, we shall have to look at the primary education level, which has to change in this country. Unless that is reformed, that is made better, that is made competent, that's made effective in this country, and that is made accessible more importantly, to all the places, to all the communities, then only our higher education system would also grow better. But look at the things. Ours is, we always say, the second largest higher education system in the world. Remember, the second largest higher education system in the world. We have more than 800 universities. We have more than 50,000 colleges, maybe one lakh. We have public sector participation. You know, I may add here public sector participation from 1960s. We have aided colleges from 1970s as per back. You know, I, I, I'm not among those who say there should be no privatization of education because the country doesn't have resources and therefore country doesn't have that much of capacity. Therefore, the private parties also need to participate to, you know, bring these levels but despite all this, as we say, higher education system, largest you know, higher education in the world and so on, despite all these problems, we find higher education, rather I would say, the total education in this country is in serious crisis. Because after Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan and Kothari Commission, we had Professor Yashpal Committee in 2009. And then conversation and clubbing and separating branches of knowledge and training from different institutions, creation of new AMS, IIMs, IITs, NITs, and dozens of central universities and scores of private universities and institutions. But the levels of performance has, level of performance has certainly, you know, all these levels have dipped in fact. One can imagine. The reasons are many and varied because country has almost stopped producing the brilliant minds, you know, in any field, for example. I'll, I'll give you an interesting information, in fact. One reason that we don't see education system as a great priority in our country. We have an approach, chalta hai chalne do, you know, it's going on, let it go on, let it go on. People are getting salaries, some funding is given for research scholars, we have upgraded that and this, but basically we find that it is not a sector, you know, we should get greatest priority because this produces the human resource, this produces the civilizational value, this produces the morality, this produces our defense sector people. It produces everybody and everything in this country. But it's not our priority. We also do not see it as holistic, in holistic manner from primary to higher levels. If I am a university professor, I am bothered about only our PG teaching, PG research. You know, we do not see what's happening in college, how these can be integrated. 
we do not realize or recognize the regional specificities that shape the overall scenario of education in this country. I mean, the facility we say always, oh, cut off in Delhi University is 100%. But what about in my Kishtwar area? What about in the deep, you know, uh, Kashmir area? What about in Himachal? What about upper reaches of UP? What about the tribal areas of Jharkhand and Madhya Pradesh? What about Northeast? What about Arunachal Pradesh? You know, we need to look into this. We also do not prioritize, prioritize the region-wise necessities. As I said, Ladakh, Haricha, Uttarakhand, Himachal, tribal areas. Look at, for example, the tribal belts of Kalahandi in Urisa. What's happening there? I mean, how are we mediating and developing accessibility to knowledge, to professionalism, to higher education, to leadership challenges, to, to other things, in fact? After becoming free, it took us six years to establish women's study centers in the post 47, you know? And even now, we don't have, as I was telling you, if you look at every university, it's not a priority. We never bothered about our diaspora, which is so vast and stratified. We never bothered about diaspora at all. We have no human rights centers or centers for studies of natural catastrophes in the universities, which are very important. We are only looking at traditional system and traditional departments that throw up some jobs for intellect, intellectuals. You know, we don't have center for population studies. The most important in this country, you know, millions of people and almost half a billion of people have got migrated from rural to urban, from urban to rural and back to urban. In so many cities have, you know, developed so much. You are in Hyderabad, you know, for example, how Hyderabad has grown over a period of time, more than, you know, uh, Karursa population and so on, but we never bother about it. We have not a single, I'm not sure whether Molanaza University will have a population study center. I don't think our university, any university for that matter, including JNU or Hyderabad University has a center for studies of urbanization, for example. Look at the geography department, geography, which is one of the very important branches of knowledge in the country, which, you know, on which depends the planning of this country. You do not find that there are geographical you know, centers for studying geography in various universities, environmental study, biodiversity, urban studies, and so on. Our large amount of funds goes into sector of bogus research, both social sciences, sciences, and language, I would say. Lots of funding into certain sectors, which really require, do not require that much of funding. And the new centers that should be open, for example, the new branches of knowledge that should be developed, we are not paying any attention to that, in fact. Schools at primary level are non-existent in places. Wherever they are, they should be required most, in fact, you know, efficient and effective. You find many societies, there are no schools, primary schools are not well cared, in fact, by the government. Very obsolete level of infrastructure. You go to the traditional or old university, state universities, even, even many central universities also now, you find very obsolete level of infrastructure. There is no compatibility between the requirement and the resources provided. There is no thrust on technology required. We have been talking from rooftops for last half a decade, digitization, digitization digital world, this, that. I mean, I am giving a lecture through Zoom. This is not digitization of high order. I call it the entire computer system. It's a language. But I try to convince the whole world that we are going digitally highway and this way. I mean, this is this is not actually, uh, you know, something wonderful. It's basically, it's a language we are also picking up and we are doing our best. But if we really have to upgrade the thrust on technology record, what is the cutting research that we have been doing in biotechnology, for example, which has not been defined in this country till now? What is that we are doing in environment? What is that we are doing to contain levels of pollution? What is that we are doing to make knowledge accessible to the poorest of the poor, marginalized? I mean, you are well aware of the Sachar Committee report, for example in so many areas where different communities are neglected. And yet we say, no, everybody 
is taken together south and whatever things are being portrayed before the public. Not, you know, knowing earlier, but we find it today, everything is subjected to ideology. I can tell you the truth of my life, I tell you, for example. A physics or a chemistry lecturer, for example, just lecture, a substandard in terms of academics, who has no vision, but because he has a particular ideology and because he has contributed in terms of that ideology. I have no objection to that ideology or this ideology. He goes and becomes a vice chancellor of Agra University. I would not like to name the people. A chemistry lecturer. Not that we don't have competent people at different levels. We have, but this is how you are promoting patronizing leadership in this country for academic institutions. What is the vision that a most junior and incompetent person by heading because he has ideological backup because he is promoted not for talent but for ideology and that's what has spoiled intellectual you know system in this country we should not only hold only government responsible for all these various institutions at various levels share the responsibility for bringing things to such a level how many of us provide a feedback to indian state at regional or state level I have seen scores after scores dissertations being written on Vijayanagar Empire, Mughal, you know, aspects, agrarian system, or maybe other things. In fact, though significant work has been done by Irfan Saab and many other scholars, but we need to change the track. There are many important things that Mughals did in this country, which remain completely, you know, unstudied till date. We, we are not, you know, uh, provide a feedback to the Indian state on, as, as I said, uh, you know, for example, working on urbanization. I think one of the significant work that has been done by Janaki Nair in JNU. Not many scholars are, you know, contributing in this field as to what's going to happen to such a large migration that's taking place. Have you ever seen in this country that school teachers come together to discuss their school problems, academic problems? Have you ever seen that the school teachers come together to discuss the problems of their building and infrastructure? Or ever they come together to debate the curriculum, the intake problems, the co-education problems, the demotivation that dawns on primary education? No. But yes, they swarm in hours when they have to demand for pay commission, for example. When they have to demand for allowances when they have to demand for mass transfers, they would protest at that point of time. And one of the problems is also that in certain sectors, for example, some of the teachers we find, you know, in, even in primary sector, we find that they go without salaries for years together. We have found in Bihar for seven, eight years, the teachers did not have salary. In this country, the doctors have to protest in COVID. You know, in Corona, the doctors have to protest in Delhi that please give a salary. What could be the worst fate of any country other than this? So teaching at primary level is a pastime kind of thing. You are located in a village school that the primary teachers have made defunct, where only a few poor students come who cannot afford to go to public or private schools or to any distant place. The same teacher runs a chit fund, business, shops, at industries farming, poultry, dairy production, and attending to his duty is a secondary question. But our country's intellectuals will not debate these issues. How many times you heard of meetings of primary teachers for curriculum, as I said, or change of consolidation or production of books or other innovations? How many times you find teachers like us intervening academically and adopting them for training? I mean, it is the duty of university teachers also to conduct programs for teachers coming from school education. But we have bifurcated the system so much that we disallow any structure to interact with any other structure in this country. Otherwise, from primary to higher education, there is a constant chain going up and down, in fact. But we find it goes up, it doesn't come down. There's no interaction. We have teachers training 
or beard colleges where certificates are sold. You know, we have hundreds of such institutions giving certificates that do not exist. In fact, as a vice chancellor, I tell you, when I was Kalyani University vice chancellor, one of the greatest minas in Bengal was beard college that did not ex exist at all. When I protested against this, can you imagine? The education minister who continues to be their part of strategy, he opened a university separately for beard college affiliation. And mind you, I can bet with you, you go and look at beard colleges in this country, they don't exist, many of them do not exist. But the bills were passed centrally in states and other places because certificates are being sold. So therefore, what it leads to, you know, the private parties are there who are opening schools, colleges, but they do not indulge in it philanthropically. You know, as happens in other countries, that's how Harvard has come up, that's how Stanford has come up. You know, if you look at Stanford, if you look at Princeton, if you look at many other universities, a beautiful book, you know, it is the American, you know, basically, uh, I would say not drug lords, the fellows who were doing opium business in China, when they earned a little more, they invested that money into founding these universities. That is the philanthropy. That let part of our investment go into because it could benefit the larger society and today it helps and benefits the world society because Stanford, Princeton, they have provided, you know, you find in economics, in fact, Professor Faridaji must be knowing it, in economics in Princeton, there is a beautiful, you know, economics department, wonderful academic, which has produced Nobel laureates. And if you look at our country, the private parties, they are fleecing people, they are putting high fees, there are no playgrounds, there is no infrastructure that should be there, but they are exploiting society and not being philanthropic. Just try and create it. We have the armies of young men and women migrating from villages to towns, town to town, city to city, region to region, in search of sustenance today. You know, why is it happening on that larger scale? Because the country's education was not planned. Because the country's policy planners never bothered what kind of planning should go into it after Kothari Commission, I'd say. Nowadays, a new catchy term has been coined as skill development programs, you know? The small portion that is holding the thread in some regions of India are central schools, Navodaya Vidyalaya, and a few community schools run by Jains, Bharti Vidya Bhavan, or Hanfia schools, or some other schools run by Muslim brethren and some of the community colleges. Looking at the private academics like Akash, you know, look at academies, Ramayya the coaching centers at Kota in Rajasthan and almost all cities, just because it's a, it's a, you know, a reserve bank for them. They manufacture money out of it and only push people into engineering bits and engineering bits. That's only happening. What about other fields? You know, it's not simply the government's problem here. The problem is a public. The problem is that intellectual is not debating that society is basically becoming unbalanced, you know, I call them IDICYG institutions. That means institution for destruction of intellectual capacity of young generations. All these coaching centers, ICFI, so many other, you know, uh, such shops which have been opened and there's no restriction on them because they pay huge amounts of money to the government, obviously. They get their licensing, they get their permissions, but at the same time, there is no regulatory authority looking into them. And the entire thing is, is resulting in destruction of institutions and young minds in this country. Mind you, there are, they are patronized by politicians, bureaucrats, policy makers, government, and they also pay for election funding, for example. There's an interesting nexus. Many industries invest in secondary schools and college to seek tax relief. And they say they are doing charity because if you look at any industry in this country, right from Tata's downwards, you'll find every industry has a school, every industry has a college. I mean, the biggest joke in this country is that a university which doesn't exist at all, which doesn't exist even on net, is given the stats of eminence. What are the intellectuals of this country doing here? So this is because of 
the nexus of industrialists who also want to not to do philanthropy, but to save taxes, in fact. If you look at the policy planning, look at the planning, it's all indoor. There are no country or region wise or institution wise discussions, seminars, debates, opinion polls, surveys. And the best example is the latest education policy. It must have been debated by director and CRT, by some person in the ministers, among the ministers, grannies, and then put up on net. And all those people who would have critically evaluated it, examined it, given their opinions, none of them must have been taken into consideration, I'm sure. These days, there is another problem. We do not study varied viewpoints. You see, you must remember that criticism always grows knowledge. At the intellectual, leaving the government, leaving the private parties aside. You know, at intellectual level also, we do not study varied viewpoints. And we, as, you know, in postmodern era, we find that we are not in a position to tolerate criticism. Because criticism grows knowledge. We do not tolerate critical thinking. You know, we, we keep on saying, Sa vidya ya vimuktaye, or alim noor hai, or vidya dhanam dadati, all kinds of these things. But when we look at virtually what's happening in the institutions, we find political lumpanization of institutions by parties that come to power. Do we discuss leadership in this country? It's academic leadership. I mean, I'm not talking about political leadership. The academic leadership, you know, that our intellectuals assume in this country, its institutions are individuals. When considering education reform, it is often easy to think of factors such as who is responsible for teachers, who is responsible for parents. These are the stakeholders in our education system. Who is responsible for institutional system, the government or political culture? The issue of gross enrollment, I am just quoting one example about gross enrollment. You know, nearly 15, 20 years back, I'm not sure whether it was 15 or 20, but it was certainly more than 10 years back, when the United Nations said that basically between 18 to 21, we must find 47% of this age group into schools, colleges because they give us funding, they decide about the parameters of education at international level, they want to take the whole world forward. And so far as India was concerned, India was also supposed to have 47% of this age group in schools and colleges. And the figure is this small. I'm sure if you look today also how much percentage we have put in schools and colleges in this age group, because it would also help us in lifting the poverty. We abuse China so much. But read this Fakopan book, which I have been telling you. You will look at China's face, maybe damn ugly, but China has succeeded in lifting millions and millions and millions of people out of poverty. And we were not in a position to grow this percentage up to 47%, even after 20 years. I think it is little over 12% in this entire country. With the focus being so entirely upon the needs of the people within the organization, the goal of organization is nearly completely lost and therefore not attained at all. Education happens in the real world where unfortunately people have shortcomings and quite often need guidance in order to get things going in right direction. We find Transformational leadership, for example, offers that some focus on individual by building an investment in end goal of organization, be it university, be it college, be it any institution, and thereby create a momentum to achieve that, you know, end goal. And this leadership takes service leadership to the next level. We have to face institutions in education and language. If we really want the leaders to serve these institutions, they have to take it to next level. They have to face institutions in education, the challenges that these institutions pose, and also 
confront the lacunae that we notice in any institution and academic system, our research inputs, our system of doing research, we must realize how success of society is dependent on operation and authority in our institution. We need also to check and balance internal complexities of people's behavior. You know, there are many institutions you find, there are very good institutions, but there's so much of academic infighting that spoils doing research, that demotivates our research scholars. That's why I said, we need to check and balance the internal complexities of people's behavior that becomes hindrance. Justice has to be given importance in administration of academic institutions. Strong linkages have to be developed between central planning and decentralized elements of the institution, which is not happening yet. Building voice and strength of institution by interacting with wider audience in each institution, that also is not happening. We do not have parents meetings in government schools, for example. It's available in private schools as a ritual on Saturdays. But it's not happening in government institutions, even colleges. Because we must remember that our country is made and unmade in our institutions. And if we build our institutions, we build our country. And if we destroy our institutions, we destroy our country. Friends, there are varied problems in academic leaderships and strategies that academicians should involve in running higher education institutions departments in our country that work in different environments all over the country. And these styles and strategies are influenced by challenge that our societal problems and political and ideological intervention pose to us from time to time. We find that our educational institutions from primary to higher level are supposed to mediate education to vast sections of students who come from varied social, economic, and cultural backgrounds. We don't study the background of you know, our students also for educating and enabling them to take up various institutional and other responsibilities to solve the problems of our society. Because each student, every student who comes to the university to higher education level, unless you study his background, he may not be very competent. You know, he may not be very competent. He may have certain difficulties and therefore he may demand and he deserves much more attention on the part of you know, uh, teachers, on the part of professors, on the part of professional administrative people in that university. But we have no mechanism to identify that except looking at lower income group, higher income group. But we have to, our departments of psychology have to examine such students and see how best and in which discipline they can flower, they can develop, they can grow, they can contribute ultimately to human society. Whether today we find our leaders lead in a way, the education leaders, the leaders in academic institutions, that is appropriate, specific to region and culture. What makes a successful leader in the field of higher education, for example, is one of the root questions, you know. If we have such difficulty, if we have so many challenges, if we have so many problems, then who becomes the best leader, you know, and how that leader evolves out of professional development and his research capacity and all. We find that educational leaders play a very, very important role in affecting the climate, attitude, and reputation of the institution. If you are academically brilliant, for example. They are the cornerstones on which learning communities function and grow. With successful education leadership, institutions become effective incubators of learning. They are places where students are not only educated, but challenged, nurtured, and encouraged. That's how we used to say earlier that even if a student came from a very, very poor background to JNU, he was able to make his headway. I think to some extent it was in Hyderabad Central University also and maybe Manu also has you know sort of evolved such kind of a system because that depends on the understanding of the community, the community of students, the community of teachers with a 
broad mind and sincerity of purpose. On the other hand, poor or absent education leadership can undermine the goals of an educational system. When educational system lacks a strong foundation, for example, and direction, learning is compromised and society suffers in the long run. So therefore, then what do we do? How do you truly become effective in providing this academic leadership in your institution? While there is no one solution to the successful leadership, there are certain strategies, there are certain methods, there are certain skills, traits, and beliefs that many of the most effective educational leaders share in this country. Effective leaders build and sustain community partnerships. They leverage those partnerships to cultivate inclusive, caring, and culturally responsive relationships. But look at our institutions, what's happening? We are discriminating nowadays between the rich and the marginalized. We are discriminating, you know, which teachers should never do in education system at all. We are discriminating between Hindu and Muslim. That's the saddest part, what's happening in this country now. You see, we are trying to reshape the whole thing by totally obliterating what Mughals have contributed to this country. What people earlier have contributed to development of this country in medieval times, we are obliterating that too. And that's the saddest part. No intellectual should feel happy about it because history will never excuse us. So therefore, this is an essential component of effective leadership, you know, to develop, cultivate inclusive, caring, and culturally responsive relationship. To build these community network, it's essential that the leaders are visible in their institutions and community and develop trust and create a sense of transparency. You know, and a shared purpose with all stakeholders, be they teachers, be they parents, be they community members be the students or other stakeholders. Great leaders should know that they are not running one man show, that they cannot do it all alone. You know, be it any vice chancellor, for example. No vice chancellor can himself and only can run the show. None of the vice chancellors. Because it's a group of teachers the vice chancellor should first of all feel and try to understand that I am a teacher and that I have to take everybody along. All teachers may not be that effective. They may not be that research oriented. Some may be good at administration, some may be good at academics, some may be good at something else, you know, in developing partnerships, effective relationships with the society. So therefore he cannot, any leader cannot do it alone. It's a teamwork. They should realize that they must surround themselves with great colleagues, in the institution, not only that, they must fully support professors and staff by encouraging them to continuously learn, develop, and perhaps most important is to become leaders themselves. You know, you need to have all these qualities. You need to have a strong religious, sorry, strong knowledge base. You need to have a strong exposition. I'll give you an interesting example here. We have in Hyderabad, you know, we have had a great intellectual. In fact, I have personally met him many times. We have had a great intellectual who became UGC chairman, Professor G. Ram Reddy, who had a very wider exposition. You know, in this country, it is Professor G. Ram Reddy who introduced the system of distance education and it was not there. And he opened the first open university you know, that's available in Hyderabad. And then it spread to other places and so on. He was the first vice chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University. This is educational leader. Here is a leader, you know, who had a wider exposition, who had wider understanding, who had a wider knowledge base, and then he tried to explore things and, you know, gave expression to his vision. And that's how distance education in this country came about. And this distance education in various universities, right from, you know, Kerala to Kashmir and many other parts, you know, Gujarat to Rajasthan to other places and so on, you find it has very significantly contributed in making education accessible to people 
in various corners of the country. We also had, for example, you know, you also find that it was he only who, you know, gave some impetus to women's studies, again from Usmania University. We have the same person who gave impetus and for the first time we find that in Hyderabad University, he opened up a dias diaspora center. And we don't have diaspora center in more than a couple of universities in India. Look at the amount of population that's every year going out, that's facing problems, be it Middle East, be it Europe, be it America, be it any other place. During COVID you have seen, but we don't have centers to study. And the government is silent, you know. They will do a deep prajulan. They will light a lamp on the day of what they call some Pravas Bharati, Pravasi Bharati, Divas and so on, and it ends there. But they don't look into it intellectually how important it is to have this center and how important it is to study problems. You have seen how people were held up in Kuwait, Muscat during the COVID, you know. Our people, our Indians, in fact. So this was the contribution of G. Ram Reddy. Similarly, we find Pale Ramara, one of the, again, great visionaries, you know, who changed the character of engineering colleges in this country by making them far more wider knowledge-based and transformed them into national institutes of technology, you know, NITs, all the engineering colleges and upgraded them. It was his contribution, I remember. Or you also have, you know, Professor Gordon Mehta, who also significantly contributed, you know, Professor Mushir Hassan of Jamia. We are today proud that Jamia is one of the best universities in the country, you know, that is doing very significant work. There have been some unfortunate incidents which have been deliberately, you know, tossed on to this university. But look at the contribution of, you know, Mushiru Hassan in this field. A great educationist, a great vision who brought university to this great level, I would say. Or if you think about your own university, who has been the best vice chancellor of your university who significantly contributed, you know? in building more than Azad Urdu National University. Can any of you tell me? It is Professor Pathan Sahab, whom I knew very well. He has a significant contribution in building MAMI. We may like it, we may dislike it, but I remember Professor Pathan would not sleep half the night. He was always up to three o'clock. He would think, discuss how I can take MAMI forward from this step which building has to come up, what infrastructure has to be brought in, what academic programs, and then also the contribution of Muhammad Mia, who carried forward the vision of Pathan Sahib very significantly. These two people, they did significant work, I tell you. Professor Pathan was a great academician and vice chancellor of this university. So therefore, these kind of works, you know, can be done only by a great visionary who has a great grasp of knowledge, who has very good academic exposition, who knows wider world in terms of institutions and so on, and they significantly, that is how we say the academic institution can develop and that's what they do, you know, the great visionaries. The material cultural formation of a particular area, for example, the geography of ethnography, the inheritance, you know, of our education system, to look at, there's a geography of education, for example. There's a culture of our institution and education. There is ethnography of our inheritance that has to be looked into when we are heading an institution, when we are taking the institution forward. Vision is perhaps one of the most important qualities, you know, of an academic leader that can have, as it provides a momentum and direction, not just for the team leader, but for each and every team member, each and every faculty member, each and every support staff member, of course, in order, you know, for leaders to be successful in pursuing their vision and enacting their plan, they must pair their vision with unrelenting passion, which is very, very important. You know, for pursuing an academic institution on the path of progress, we must have passion for that. We must have vision for that. Vision and passion, you know, from are very, very effective 
you know, concerns and characteristics of a leader who should generate inspiration, who should generate motivation, who should generate excitement that permeates throughout the entire research school, research organization, research institution. The other important aspect is that successful leaders believe that effective leaders provide a clear vision and sense of direction for institution. That's what a successful, successful, you know, successful leaders believe. They prioritize what's important in university. Now, I can tell you an interesting joke, for example, about Allahabad University. I have seen after I left, before I was there, a proposal was brought to me, sir. There is a tower clock here which you know deserves one crore rupees of repair. And in some of the departments, there's no infrastructure for students to sit in the classroom. Now, what should I prefer? I prefer that there should be infrastructure for students, that tower clock as part of heritage, it can wait for some time. But once I left the tower clock, came to the forefront, people want to spend one crore rupees, you know, take a commission out of that and put that clock there. But students can wait, this is the problem. You have such leaders also in universities who neglect intentionally, deliberately, without vision, the priorities of the institution. You have to attend to priorities of institution that is more important and priorities that push academic environment forward. We also find that a successful leader who provides a clear vision and sense of direction to an institution that he prioritizes and takes you know, such initiatives that will have little impact on the work of students. You know, whatever initiatives we take, it should not impact badly students because students are, in fact, really, if you look at any institution, they are the real people, in fact, participants in this process of education. We may have so many teachers, so many laboratories. If we don't have students, and we are not there for anything else. Our completely entire effort is futile. Therefore, Inflicting of intolerance, for example, on other sects is also a greatest injury to the institution. You know, if as academic leaders, be it in research, be it in other places, if we are discriminatory in our behavior, we are living in a multicultural society. And the root of this country, for the growth of this country, for the existence and identity of this country, multi Culturalism is very much must, plurality is must. Therefore, we should not discriminate, you know, on the basis of institutional levels, like say that this is a mano, this doesn't concern to majority community, and so therefore leave it aside. Let there be less funding than other institutions. Then we are destroying the country. We are not destroying mano because the teacher and doctors should not discriminate, I would say. Nobody should discriminate for that matter, but we cannot afford to discriminate in educational institutions. You know, so therefore, if a visionary leader is there, if he wants to be quite more, far more successful, he should not have intolerant attitude towards any community in any institution. Leaders in education have to think about inclusion. They have to think about social justice. We are not able to decide about roster in an institution for more than two, three years, in fact. I mean, what are the leaders worth if they are not in a position to think about the roster, if they are not in a position to provide roster? I have found in institutions where some people, you know, in caste grouping, as you find, that they uh, want to play with roster to see that their community gets more posts and somebody else's gets less. And it becomes a battleground. You know, we must follow rule of law. We must follow the more academic morality. This is this is the kind of discrimination that I have seen personally in various institutions existing. So therefore, social justice also is the responsibility of leaders. Advancing people's welfare should be the greatest responsibility of all of us as teachers, as professors, as leaders in education, by voluntary means and not by force. It can't be done by force. Because we must always remember that when I say what is my good, my good is not my community's good. 
my good is what is good for public. Public good is our good. You know, that's what we should always think that public good is we are part of that. And public good is our good. So leaders with complete service module take the focus from the end goal to people who are being led. There is no sense of self-interest on the part of only the interests of an institution. Guidance, empowerment, culture of trust are hallmarks of leadership. You know, a leader must put complete trust in the process and in his, her colleagues, followers, assuming that those within the organization will align with the goal, with larger goal. You know, he must have, he should put in trust because they are permanent, you know, residents of this institution. They are the permanent, you know, pillars of the institution because by chances come and go. That also registrars come and go. Officers come and go. But the pillars of the institution teachers, so therefore they all should be patronizing and their interests, students' interests are primary for any institution. Guidance, for example, empowerment and culture of trust are hallmarks, as I said, of leadership. And a leader has to be just, but he has to be also at times very stern about certain issues of behavior, for example, in universities. So I was talking about that the, you know, leaders sometimes of academic institutions have to also be stern sometimes, you know, uh, because they find different kinds of behaviors on the part of teachers, on the part of students, and uh, some that creates sometimes problem for the institution. And I have discovered the best example, you know, so long as Ashoka, the great ruler, was stern, in fact, a little more disciplined in his behavior. We found that the kingdom was really growing. And the day we find he talked about morality, religion, and other things, we find that it declined. It declined so drastically that the entire Mauryan empire, you know, disappeared in the process. So therefore, the leaders shall have to take lessons from that and, uh, you know, look into that. The role of institution in production of we find efficient and successful human resources and people have to take up challenges facing the country. We are sometimes taking challenges which are very little, which are individualistic, how my research will progress, but we are not picking problems that country is confronting in fact. To also ensure institutions view of advancing justice in behavior that involves restrictions, punishment and discipline also. You know, we have to, when we say punishment and discipline, I do not mean that we must sort of as a vice chancellor hang everybody. We must patronize talent, that is discipline in fact. We should not discriminate, you know. Then other question that also confronts us, does the role of leaders and the nature of strategies academically involved in higher education help institutions to assess their progress and lead them in the way that is culturally and pedagogically responsive to the stakeholders, you know, to or, or, or to the strengths and the needs of the institution, for example. You see, for example, you people are uh, dealing with Professor Dr. Taha also with this question of inclusive. You see, inclusive approach provides all students with access to flexible learning, choices, effective paths for achieving educational goals in spaces where they experience a sense of belonging. That's important. You know, this was one of the important things that Partha Sarthi had earlier uh, you know, vice chancellors worked in uh, JNU as leaders of the institution that it creates a sense of belonging, in fact. You know, the best educators know this and they prioritize inclusivity, creating safe learning environments that nurture every student. You know, then also the leaders, they prioritize inclusive learning also typically that they believe every person can contribute to the greater learning community and therefore they encourage collaboration between faculty and students. One is between institution and institution, but there is also collaboration between faculty and students. If you go to the Western universities, you will find many professors, you know, they allow the students to stay with them in their own houses. And that gives, you know, that shuns the formality, that shuns the ego of institution and uh, the, the, you know, persons and therefore, it helps institution to grow and also the faculty members. Perhaps the most critical role in successful inclusive institution is the role of the leader, the head of the institution. It's not simply the head as vice chancellor, as dean, as professor, as chairperson, 
the leader's active participation in single most important predicator of success in implementing change, for example. We have, we have to constantly think how best we can improve, and we cannot improve without changing the system, improving services, setting new courses. The leader is central to facilitating the systemic change and leading faculty to adopt new attitudes and new practices. I have discovered that the passion is a critical ingredient for nearly anyone who wants to be successful and happy in his job. Be a teacher. I mean, if not, I have no interest in teaching. Why should I, you know, uh, sort of go to the teaching? I should have whatever job I like, I should do that. And I should have passion for doing that. And then only we find that it really helps the institution by passion. Uh, you know, but passion is especially important for institutional leaders who typically have a great influence, for example, you know, greater influence on their institution's climate and culture, you know, because each institution has its own climate, each institution has its own culture. So therefore passionate people have a contagious energy that can greatly affect a teacher's satisfaction. We were talking about, you know, the leaders in academic fields. In fact, the leaders, as I said, the heads of departments, the professors themselves, the deans, and uh, chairpersons and even the vice chancellors, they have to be passionate, you know, about their work because someone who cares about not only because for he or she is working, you know, sometimes we think because, you know, one person is working and therefore I'll do it. No, we have to be passionate about the entire working of the institution because passion for varied projects in university and for people involved are key to successful leadership. That's what I have personally also found. We should remember that our social world is, you know, they develop out of individuals' interactions with their culture and society, a larger society, in fact. Putting it simply, every interaction between people is an opportunity for a vice chancellor, for a dean, for a head, for a chairperson to expand one's knowledge base and also promote institutions' interests. You know, the leader places its focus on tasks rather than on qualities of individual leader. You know, the tasks that are ahead of him. Leadership comes into prominence due to charismatic nature of the leader, and also when leaders handle tasks of greater complexity in institutions. In this process, everyday activities make the difference. And I did see that how Pathan Sahib really was handling, you know, a lot of personal discussions we had, very, very complex issues in a very simple manner. Sometimes the interesting thing about leader is that it already works with how most public entities handle their affairs, government does. After all, construct a goal that would require leaders to distribute their efforts so that they can achieve this goal. Today, there are no goals for government or educational system to achieve. That's what I find. In fact, I may be wrong also sometimes. You know it better because I am retired from the institution here. So therefore, I find that there are, basically there are no goals as my experience is that the government has no goal so far as education is concerned. The new and frequent changes that take place, they indicate changes in government econ knowledge economy. We see a form of welfare in education proven by these, you know, such as universal educational system, education for all, education for girl child, to symbolize the trend towards, you know, viewing education as something other than market commodity in age. Governments around the world are set on creating a policy that ensures that literacy is achieved by all. The role that leader is therefore shifting from economic management to social management. But we make big goals, education for girl child, you know, taking education school to every doorstep and like that. But in reality, we do not find that this is transacting in any institution, for example. But in reality, education is treated as a market commodity. Look at the recent bill I was telling you, the recognition was given, in fact, six, seven months back, I think not only seven months back, a year before when Javadekar was the minister. Education bill was passed regarding beard colleges. As I earlier also said, I mean, if you look at, there are hundreds and hundreds of colleges that are, don't exist at all. But the bill was passed, you know, for giving the degrees. And this goes as an academic investment into our primary and secondary education. What will happen to the future? What kind of you know, intake the universities will have. Ultimately, we find that a leader in higher education blends several leadership qualities. Unless he does that, he is not a leader. Unless he blends values, qualities, principles, he, she shifts the emphasizing control and dominance to focusing on connectedness in any institution, for example, cooperation, 
and communication, you know, with larger community of students, teachers. Leadership aims at inviting all interesting stakeholders to succeed. It involves sending positive messages to people, making them feel that they are valuable, that they are responsible, they are worthwhile. The messages are often delivered through the institution's policies, programs, practices, physical environment. That's how our messages can be converted. If we build the institution, its environment, its academic atmosphere, then we send a message. When implemented in educational setting, the elements of leadership combine to create an environment that is cohesive, efficient, and conducive to learning. You know, you look at certain institutions, for example, you find that nobody prefers when you have to select a college for your child or a school for your child. What do you do? No, 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 that's not good. On what parameters? Because your assessment is correct. When we say that's not good, this is not good, means the institution's functioning does not attract people. That climate has not been cultivated. That passion in that institution is not there. As a result, you find that certain institutions and programs, policies, they die there. When implemented in the education setting, for example, the larger goals, as I said, you know, in inviting stakeholders to succeed for sending positive messages, as I said, when these things are implemented education setting, the elements of leadership combine then all to create an environment that is cohesive, efficient, and conducive for learning. Invitational leaders, you know, some of the leaders also, they invite everyone who has a stake in success of the school, success of the university, success of the college, and generate synergy at all levels for the common goal. You know, these are, these are very, very important things. Are all, another question that confronts us today is, are all the government's implement plans directed to prioritize goals? And do they identify strategic actions to achieve their objective? You know, when we look at, we must have a look at, this. we find that the government introduces frequent changes, interventions by government, while good can also be disrupted when it occurs too frequently. That's my theory. You know, you look at, for example, I'll give you two best examples. When employment was taking place, we found under certain government, UGC changed that now University Grants Commission will decide. Does University Grants Commission have all the wisdom to decide about different academic journals? What are the journals to be included into career of academics? And this was so frequently changed that it disrupted the whole system. We find during that lot, many institutions, people were not in selection committees able to decide how to pick up the talent because many journals were there which were completely bogus overnight manufactured. You know, this is what government policy does to education when there are no experienced people to look into this. You know, are the question of, for example, roster system and reservation issue. You have seen how many ordinances within one year, I think 2019 or 18 were brought in, you know, when selections had to be done on war footing in different institutions, which have not taken place in many universities of the country, except Hyderabad and maybe Jamia to some extent. But they have not taken because the reservation issue was taken to court and government could at some point of time intervene for the betterment of this country. So in the case of educational institutional leadership, it has been documented that frequent turnover results in a negative climate. The turnover results, if you look at frequently these changes, it, it results into negative climate, which in turn has a negative effect on student performance, which has negative impact on employees functioning. You know, I have seen it very, very, you know, Interestingly, in, in uh, my university, for example, one of the vice chancellors there actually, uh, I would not like to name him, in fact, he prioritized and ordered few crores of rupees to be spent and made planning for this. And we found that there was no money. The money had not come from ministry. There was no money, but he entertained planning all this and paid huge amount of money to consultants while as it was not there. And this, as a succeeding vice chancellor, I have to resolve those issues, in fact. You can imagine. This is what happens to institutions when you have people who have very limited thinking, in fact, for the institutions. So committed and effective leaders who remain in their institutions are associated with the improved institutions achievement. As a corollary, we find that the leader's turnover is associated with lower gains in student achievement. Leadership turnover has a more significant negative effect in the higher high you know, poverty areas, 
low achieving institutions the very institutions in which students most rely on their education for future success is in fact we find that the negative effect of leadership turnover suggests that the leaders need time to make meaningful improvements in their institutions and these meaningful improvements cannot be done overnight they need to be done over a longer period of time you know that takes 3 to 5 years to find a new leader for the performance to rebound to the pre turnover level in fact agitationism for example demotivation of workers and you know that emboldens thieves also who want to plunder the institution in fact i mean education has difficult such a level that why chances in some institutions have to take a round whether the teacher is taking class in some of the institutions it may not be the condition all over but in some of the institutions it has difficult to such an extent because of demotivation because of agitation so therefore the best leaders therefore in education field are willing to commit to and preserve in a situation despite obstacles or challenges after all realizing a vision does not happen overnight that we must remember true transformation takes time when you talk in terms of professional development when you talk of research when you talk of becoming an academic leader we find that this transformation takes a longer period of time a leader's commitment displays not only passion but dedication which can have a tremendously positive impact on our university system and university culture so as an educational leader i know the failure can be the greatest teacher you know if we want to learn in any institution i would personally say i have always learned only from my failures and the failures of others so therefore failure can be one of the greatest teachers for all of us even even as teachers also just as teachers should encourage risk taking among us their students their research scholars in order to spur growth truly effective leaders encourage risk taking among us their colleagues by creating a kind of supportive environment you know that rewards not just the successful ideas or initiatives but effort as well no matter the outcome you know we also find that failure is required for learning as i said but our relentless pursuit of results can also discourage employees from taking chances you know to resolve this conflict leaders must create a culture support risk taking one way of doing this is to control experiments use controlled experiments that allow for small failures and require rapid feedback and correction you know we must collect you see look at the university system for example a feedback system was introduced that feedback form teacher has to fill it up at the end of we filled it i did it for all the years of my teaching in hyderabad university few years in jnu few years at different institutions but we found i found personally there are many institutions where teachers have for just that they are competent teachers they are better teachers but still they have you know they 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 don't want to you know uh, introduce this feedback form they have certain egos about it you know and this provides a platform for building collective intelligence so that employees learn from each other's mistakes too self finance is another disease these days you know self finance is another disease in many government institutions also where people make money and sort of partly privatize government education you can imagine within the universities within the institution we have all heard that saying you know i would i would quote here the saying do as i say not as i do you know of course the irony is that actions are much more telling than words leaders who lead by example position themselves as tremendous role models for not only the students in their school or district but for colleges and also parents as well a leader that leads by example almost always receives respect and admiration any teacher for that matter you can see who leads without which he or she will find little lack in leadership as philosopher as a physician albert swet albert swetcher once said i am i am quoting him he said one of the best thing he ever said was example is not the main thing in influencing others it is the it's only one thing you know setting examples for example that's not the main thing which influences others setting example is one thing you know teachers are motivated and willing to try new strategies because they trust the leaders to support them students are motivated and connected to institution because of the nature of learning in fact you find because they trust their teachers families are supporting to institutions because the leaders have built a trusting relationship with them you know that's how it goes 
it is no secret that when people are fulfilled and given opportunity for career growth, as well as autonomy and control over their careers, they are more productive. This also we have seen, more engaged and also more effective overall. We find through offering professional development opportunities in research and development of careers of teachers, support services to teachers, as well as creating an environment where teachers are able to experiment, to involve, to innovate, to lead. The leaders can ensure a healthy environment for educators that will have positive repercussions for the students. In his, one of the important books, What Great Principles Do Differently, Todd Whitetaker wrote once, and I quote, Great leaders focus on improving the quality of teachers within their institutions, you know, by carefully hiring the best teachers, by supporting their efforts and by their ambitions, by holding all staff members to high expectations and by working to carefully support the individual development of each professional impact student and achievement. Successful leaders, therefore, unquote, therefore, all the successful leaders, you know, use data, including standardized institution-based assessments to drive continuous improvement through site-based decision-making for express purpose of promoting equitable and culturally responsive, you know, opportunities for students. The opportunities that, you know, the different kinds of data that have been collected, that it, it presents are many and most effective leaders are able to leverage the data to make strategic distance to benefit their students. What I mean here is that there is also these leaders should from time to time collect different kinds of data. We have annual reports in central universities. We have, you know, apart from annual reports, there are other reports also which are put up to, you know, finance reports, so many other reports put up to academic council. You know, they are not simply for bureaucratic use or to convince anybody how bulky the reports and what are things. These are basically the mechanism behind them is to project the growth of individual to project the teachers and non-teacher staff and support staff, you know, and the institution's growth and decline, which gets reflected into its reports if you look at it. Which teacher has produced how many papers, how much of research has been done, how much of funding has been, you know, spent, and how much more could be required if we project our growth on the basis of these reports and this data. And therefore, the vice chancellors should use professors chairpersons and heads, they should use this data. We should see the institutional arrangement is mesh with the behavioral norms of each institution because each institution has its sensitivity. Each institution has its behavioral differences. When institution builds in social behavior, people would abandon self-interest. That is the greatest thing. Today, what has happened because of destruction by politicians of various institutions, you know, we find that by destroying these institutions, self-interest has become primary institutions interest has become second but if we abandon that you know it's social basis people would abandon self-interest if we build institutions social basis they would abandon it and they would follow institutional behavior you know and no self-interest institutions you know interest would be primary in fact then if that happens how can the role of a leader and nature of strategies contribute in meaningful ways for improvement of academic levels and serve to promote and enhance institutional function. This is also one of the challenges for young teachers particularly. You know, In response to this, I would say, achievement begins with a desire. I often say that any achievement you know, that gets reflected, that achieve, you achieve in life, any achievement that gets complete, in fact, it starts with the desire. If you have the desire you know, to achieve, you can do that. Perhaps the most important of all qualities that any academician should have is the unquestionable thirst for knowledge. Every time new knowledge, as John F. Kennedy once said, that leadership, learning are indispensable to each other. That the leader or a teacher, a professor, has to keep on learning. You must remember that the death of the professor, death of the teacher takes place the day he stops looking for new knowledge. The day he stops purchasing books or looking into nowadays, everything is available on net. The day he stops reading, I would say, 
the day he starts imbibing, stops imbibing new ideas, the best leaders, no matter what institution they work in, no, they will never know it at all. You know, they are humble in their knowledge, yet confident in their abilities. They are endlessly curious individuals who never stop questioning and learning, gathering, yes men battalion is disaster. You know, when we are learning and if we only gather yes men battalion, that would be disaster for the institution. We must gather as a leader. If you are a head of department, if you are a chairperson, if you are a, you know, institution's head, a vice chancellor, or any other capacity as an academic leader, you must always welcome critical minds. Even if they criticize you, you must love the critical minds, you know, because criticism, when it grows, it, it really grows knowledge. It gives you the other viewpoint, not the yes men, but in our institutions, there are people who gather yes men around them, the leaders. And thus we find that the institution dies that day. It takes a real sense of personal commitment, especially after you arrived at a position of power and responsibility to push yourself, grow and challenge conventional wisdom. Which is why two of the most important questions leaders face are as simple as they are profound. We should ask ourselves every time, is there compatibility between the speed of your learning as an organization and as an individual and the fast changing world, you know, is there a compatibility? There can never be compatibility. If I would say that I have acquired all knowledge, now there is nothing. That's not, that's a stupid idea. Because knowledge keeps on growing. Every moment, every second, you know, in biosciences, in sciences, even in history, you can tell, I can tell. The knowledge grows so fast. So you need to be in touch with that. There's always incompatibility. The knowledge base is growing. Our capacity to learn is limited. And it is not growing with equal speed. For the institution, if it has to put, we have to make great efforts that we at least go nearer to compatibility. We maintain, try to maintain compatibility. John Goddard also have seen these ideas of these people, you know. He says the best leaders I have gotten to know are not just the only boldest thinkers. They are the most insatiable learners that who have the capacity to learn. They are the leaders, you know, who have, are insatiable learners in any institution, but we do not tolerate these days, we don't tolerate each other's opinion in a small department. You know, that's also happening in university. This, but what about leadership? You know, ultimately we find not just who is leading the change. The leader is not just the one who is leading the change. Fortunately, when it comes to developing an idea for effective leadership, there is no need to invent. We learn by practice and we, delightfully burden ourselves with work. That's the leader. There are several leadership styles that evolve out of academics by way of work, face challenges, perform their responsibilities for good of society and institution, you know, but the goodness has to do much with the smartness. Smartness is quite a novel idea as it might appear. You know, the goodness to do has too much to do with the smartness in fact. Because that also the smartness, I don't mean physical smart, I mean academic smartness. You may have immense amount of knowledge, but you are not in a position to deliver and share it with the students. You see, knowledge is not knowledge unless we share it. I would collect a wonderful data and I say, I keep on using that. No, it has to be shared. Then only you find the different kinds of ideas would come to us. So emphasis on building the institution is very much necessary because we need to explore ways of advancing justice in the institutions and society, we are responsible to society for resolving society's problems. Therefore, we are duty bound to ensure how consistently and coherently any system can be treated into practice to achieve perfect results that our country deserves. So our greatest, you know, desire as academicians should be, not simply that I would become associate professor, assistant professor like that, should be, to create a knowledge base and involve in such goals that pertain to our institution for the public good, for example, you know? And how consistently and coherently we do that, that is what is important, you know, for achieving the wonderful results for any particular institution. Therefore, we have to pool 
our enthusiasm, our knowledge, our sharing of knowledge with other colleagues and consistently make efforts with great passion for learning things that are not, you know, that we are not knowledgeable about. So that is what will make you. Your professional development automatically takes care of if you really want to pursue knowledge, consistently develop new ideas, have a great vision. You look at, you see, for example, in our university system, sometimes we get disheartened, many of us, in fact, you know, we design a program. In many universities, we find, unless there's a government okay, whether ICT has a permission, whether UGC has approved it, we don't have that kind of decentralization that exists in the West, in American universities, I'm telling you. You see, for example, ethnography, I was giving you an example, you know, is a great discipline. Geography is a great discipline. Population studies, urban studies, women's studies, diaspora, they're new. But we have to always, we'll not get funding unless UGC gives a stamp on this. I think that all serious institutions have to take note of this, that unless in our country, there is decentralization in these academic institutions and academic institutions, and the teachers, the professors, the academic leaders are permitted, allowed to take their own decisions, how they can take the research forward. Unless that is being done, the country is in great danger. I, again, thank you all for patience. I am extremely sorry for disruptions because we in JNK don't have 4G. Even now it is not working, even though government shouts from the rooftops, we are in difficulty. And therefore, I thank you profusely for your patience, for your understanding, and a million of thanks to Professor Faridaji. She is one of the absolute finest economists of our country, and Dr. Taha, who is also a budding and brilliant scholar. Thank you all.